Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thanks for joining us today for the Allen Institute October 2012 public release webinar. My name is Terry Gilbert. I'm the application scientist at the Allen Institute. What that means is I train our users in how to use all of our different applications. I'm also um, your liaison, so if you have any questions, you can um, ask me those questions and I'll show you how to get in touch with me. Also here in the training is Chin Deng, who is our Chief Technology Officer. I'm gonna give a basic introduction to the Allen Institute for Brain Science. I'm gonna go over what was released this October and then I'm going to have specific demonstrations using the updated atlases. So I will be online actually demonstrating the new, the new uses and the, the new features and the new data sets. But you're also free to go online and practice, uh, practice yourself. And then there'll, there'll be an opportunity near the end for you to ask uh, different questions. So my, my intention is that you're familiar with the portal and our resources and how to navigate all of our different resources, that you have a basic orientation to the updated data sets. Most importantly, that you know how to get the information you need and how to ask specific questions. So at the Allen Institute, our overarching goal is to understand the brain. We are doing it systematically. So we started with genes, right? We've started to get into cell types and connections. We're looking at computation, but ultimately we're interested in answering those really fundamental, interesting questions about the brain. You know, what's consciousness and memory and behavior and thought and all of that. So the mission of the Institute, the Allen Institute for Brain Science, is to accelerate the understanding of how the human brain works, both in health and disease. And we use a team science approach to generate useful public resources. We drive technological and analytical advances, and we discover fundamental brain properties all through the integration of experiments, modeling, and theory. You know, brain diseases and disorders affect millions of people, and here are just some of the statistics about it. The diseases and disorders of the brain are expensive. And the brain is the most complex system in the human body, and we know the least about it of all of our systems. That's why it matters. And who we are in the matter is, well, first of all, we're an, an independent, nonprofit medical research organization. We are advancing the understanding of the brain in health and disease. Now, we're, while we do a lot of the science here, we're really clear that not all of that science is going to be done here. We literally are... Uh, providing resources so that neuroscientists throughout the world can answer these questions. In our particular, the, the work that we do, we're project focused and we're milestone driven. So we're distinct from an academic model. So how this gets done is um, we've got multidisciplinary teams and we all work towards the same common goals. And uh, our teams are, we've got mathematicians and physicists, engineers, biologists, molecular biologists, systems, molecular neuroscientists, geneticists, anatomists, computer scientists, we all are, it's a very multidisciplinary team. And not only is the team multidisciplinary, but who we serve our data out to is also multidisciplinary. We reach all six continents, all sorts of research organizations, research programs, from basic science all the way through the clinic. And, I'll, and I keep, I'll keep saying we're team-based. So um, uh, this really does allow us just to focus on the science. We're an organization that is uniquely set up to tackle really big questions, like how is the brain built? And what are the, what are the different parts of the brain? And how do all these different parts connect? how do all of these different parts receive, store, and act on the information? And then also what goes wrong? So we're able to ask these large scale questions. And then the, you know, the answers that we, that we come up with, we put online so that they're free for you to use. So, so far, 
what we have online that are resources for you to use, our Institute Atlas Initiatives, which is the, the Adult Mouse Brain Atlas, the Developing Mouse Brain Atlas, and the Adult, or I mean the Spinal Cord Atlas, that's a mouse atlas as well, that has both a juvenile and an adult stage. Those three atlases are in the situ hybridization data. And I'll talk a little bit about, about that. We also have our newest, our newest resource is the Mouse Brain Connectivity Atlas, and I'll be talking a lot about that since we've got some really exciting new features in that. And our Human Brain Atlas includes in situ hybridization as well as microarray data. One of the unique features with all of our resources is our uh, reference atlases that uh, complement all of the data. We also have sponsored atlases. We have um, the Brain Atlas of the Developing Human Brain. We have a non-human primate atlas and an ivy glioblastoma atlas. And then there are smaller focus studies, the sleep study and the mouse diversity study. We also have uh, transgenic mouse lines that are available for the community to use that are distributed through Jackson Laboratories. I'm not going to be talking about all of these different resources. There's um, a way for you to get in touch with me if you're interested in a particular one that we don't talk about. In this particular data release, uh, we had a we this actually happened the last release, but I want to keep letting people know about our application programming interface. All of the applications that we have on the website were our version of what to do with the data. But one of the things that we do is we allow you complete access to the data so that you can create your own applications or you can look at and mine and analyze the data however you see fit. So I'll talk a little bit about the where to where to find that data and also some of the resources that are available now. And every year we have a, a hackathon where we invite people who are computationally inclined to come have at the data and access to our developers so that you can create your own your own applications or your own mashups regarding the data. That's I'll I'll show you the website where you can uh, where you can keep your eye on when when those kinds of events happen. With the Allen Human Brain Atlas, we now have our fourth Human Brain Online. So we have uh, now four brains online, and I'll show you that data a little bit. We have a new in situ hybridization study that um, just the, we've just got the first data release from that. It looks at 176 genes in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And then we have a new gene details page that I'll walk you through, which, which really allows you to see gene expression, microarray gene expression, in a structure. It's a representation of the, of the microarray data. Inside of our developing human brain atlas, which we call the brain span atlas of the developing human brain, there's a new in situ hybridization browsing interface. We have a new reference atlas. And I'll walk you through that because that particular interactive reference atlas, it, it also applies to adult human as well as mouse. Um, but it's a, it's a great new feature. This page also has a new GT, gene details page to allow you to see gene expression Inside of, a, inside of a structure. There are new updates to the NIH Blueprint Non-Human Primate Atlas, or our NHP Atlas. We've upgraded the, the in-situ hybridization interface to match our other uh, non-mouse in-situ hybridization data, and I'll walk you through that. And, uh, and then there's new microarray data and new reference data for that particular data set as well. And then what I want to show you is our mouse brain connectivity atlas. We've had data for this particular atlas for about a year. However, we now have uh, the informatics behind this particular data set that allows you to see this data in three dimensions. That's what, why I wanted you to download the Brain Explorer. You can, you know, I'll show you how to use it and then you can play with it yourself. First of all, this is, a, this is just a screenshot from our uh, from our data portal, you've, if you've already gone to download the Brain Explorer, you've already seen this. This front page is the page you should bookmark because it, uh, it will take you to what's new. It, it allow you to uh, see new tutorials, to see new events that we've, got, that we've got planned. And it also has, gives you access to all of the different projects that the Allen Institute has. There's also access to our application programming interface from this particular page. So what I want, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take you there now. 
So this is our this is the portal page. If you go to our API tab, so the API tab in the banner, it takes you to our Allen Brain Atlas application programming interface. And this is documented. If you click on this link right here, it'll take you to our the, the API homepage. You can down, read through the documentation and download uh, the data. And there's services in here as well. I'm not a computer scientist, so if you have any questions, absolutely send me a question using the Contact Us link in the top and I will send it on to the member of the team who can't answer your question. Now, one of the, the features we have is the, a page from our 2012 Allen Brain Atlas Hackathon. So it's in, you connect to that from this link at the bottom here. And in this particular, this particular page, you, there, are, there are presentations from all of the different speakers that we had, and there are references material here that are very useful for you to use. So if you are if you are studying both the mouse, both the developmental or the adult, um, just as an example, there's we have two different ontologies, a developmental ontology as well as a as an adult ontology. And for example, this particular page overlaps both the ontology for the developing mouse as well as the ontology for the adult mouse. Um, on one on one sheet. Okay, now some of you that might mean a lot, some of you that might mean not mean anything at all, but this is actually a page that's useful. It's got useful resources. So, you know, I and you know, there's the, these are all the different participants for the project and some of the applications that they created while they were here. So, uh, if you are programmatically inclined, if you want access to the data, I recommend uh, looking at our API as well as that particular page. What I want to do now is I want to talk a little bit about the Human Brain Atlas before I show you the different uh, upgrades, just so you have an idea of what it is that you're looking at. I apologize, this is not an updated slide, but this is a microarray data, which is all the genes and all the structures. We've got microarray data from two full adult control brains and two from a single hemisphere. Okay, so there's approximately a thousand distinct anatomic region or samples that were taken from the two full brains and about half that for each of the single hemispheres. We also have histology, MRI, and DTI, which we've uh, combined to show you the gene expression throughout the brain. We also have in situ hybridization data. We've got five studies. I'll, I'll show, you, show you those. So we have a subcortex study a thousand gene survey, the schizophrenia study, we also have an autism study and a neurotransmitter study. So just to walk you through a little bit of what it is that we that we do for our microarray studies is we have a whole brain. We get our brains from brain banks, either from the East Coast, we've got one one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast, and within 24 hours we take an MRI of the brain, either in cranio in the skull or ex cranio out of the skull, and then the brain is slabbed and frozen. And then it's sent to the Allen Institute. One of the problems with using or, or studying a human brain is it's so large, especially when you want to get to cellular resolution, that most of what we do is to be able to localize where you are in the brain. So one of the first things that we do is we take an initial image of the entire block face, we take pictures of the entire block face of the, of the coronal slabs, and then we cut those slabs into, into blocks that we can fit into our high throughput platform. And there's several things that we do. We look at, the, we look at some in-situ hybridization, we do nissel staining, we do immunohistochemistry. But on the final block, we take an entire cortical layer and we extract the RNA and run it on a chip. And in the subcortex, there's some extra, extra work that's done. We do the same thing that we do in the cortex, but we also section parts of the brain onto membrane slides, and then we laser microdissect out those different areas, extract that RNA, and run that on a chip. In this particular release, we have additional data 
and enhanced features. We have a, a high resolution in situ hybridization study from a neuro, neurotransmitter survey. So we're looking at uh, the neurotransmitter, select neurotransmitter systems in major cortical and subcortical areas of the, of the adult human brain. And this is our first data release. And what we've released so far is 176 genes just in a single region of the brain, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And we have that for four distinct brains. We also have microarray data from a fourth brain, and then we have an updated gene summary page. So I'm going to uh, take you to the application so that, so that I can show you each, each of those things. So here we are at the application. You click on the Human Brain Atlas. And I'm going to show you first the in-situ hybridization data. So if you click on the ISH tab at the top, what you'll notice is that we have several distinct studies. We've got subcortex study, autism study, cortex study, the schizophrenia study, and our newest study, the neurotransmitter study. If you click on any one of these particular links, what opens up is a page for you to browse through the genes. Now, the, our in-situ hybridization data is not genome-wide. So it doesn't have all of, the, all of the genes. And what this allows you to do is to browse through. So in this particular study, you can see the gene, different de, gene categories. We have marker types, neurotransmitter system, and gene fam, families. So if you're interested in G-protein coupled receptors, you can browse through the different GPCRs that we've, uh, that we've looked at in this particular study. And here's the, the, the four different donors are listed up at the top. You can search through just single donors. So I'm not going to go into this study or into the in-situ hybridization data for the Human Brain Atlas, but this is how you access this new study. Uh, we're going to go to the microarray data set in the Allen Human Brain Atlas. With this particular data set, you can select on one of the tags in this tag cloud. What you're seeing here is our microarray data. What I want to point out is the very top band at the top here, this, this, uh, this row, shows the four different colors. The orange, blue, green, and I think that's like a maroon color, represent each of the four di different donors. The colors underneath that represent the different structures. And this button in the corner, a toggle button in the corner, changes the initial sort parameter. So now all of the brains are interleaved, and you're looking at each of the different structures. So this is, this is a very, very basic introduction in how to look at the data. You know, all of the different data points are in, the, in this heat map. And what you're looking at is our normalized gene expression for each of the genes in this, in this, uh, in this column. And when I say normalized, what that means is that any, any points that are white are average gene expression. Anything you see in the blue would be underexpressed in that particular area. Anything you see in red is overexpressed in that particular area. And as you mouse over all of the data in the heat map, you'll notice that what you see in the top, you can see the donor as well as the different structures that you're looking at. And as you click on any of the data sets, you bring up metadata above the heat map. And the metadata above that heat map tells you information for that particular point highlighted at this particular gene, this particular gene probe, and in this particular structure. What I do want to show you, though, is a view of how to see gene expression in the brain. If you click on the gene name or the gene symbol. So this particular gene, AKT3, once you click on it, it takes you to a gene detail page. So I'm going to walk you through this. Because of how we sampled the brain in very discrete regions, we didn't sample the entire brain, people wanted to know is, well, what's the gene expression in a particular structure? This is our answer to that particular question. So first of all, you get gene metadata, right? You get the name of the gene as well as other aliases. You've got probe data. So this gives you the sequence data, the sequence length, 
um, the, the GC percentage. And, uh, and then what you are looking at below this are you're looking at each of the different donors. And these are different views of the brain, representations of the brain. This particular view is the outside hemisphere. This is the inner hemisphere. What you're looking at here are subcortical regions. And here you're looking at, at the brain stem and some subcortical regions as well. Each of the different regions, if you select on them, will be highlighted. So what you're looking at here then is the what I've highlighted is the post-central gyrus in this particular donor. It's highlighted here and it gives you information. It gives you the, the normalized z-score or the normalized gene expression as well as the raw data. So what we did in this particular region is we sampled in one or more places and what we're, what we're showing you here is the representation of the gene expression in that particular region. And you can click on any of the particular regions. This is the corpus callosum that I've got selected now. It, like I said, it gives you the, the data from that particular view. Now, if you're interested, one of the things you can do is you can look at the, the planar view from this page. So if you want to see what samples actually gave us this particular data set, you can look in the planar view. One of the things that uh, this also allows you to do is it allows you to comp compare different regions. So if you're interested in gene expression in the frontal pole um, as compared to the, uh, in the occipital region, um, if you mouse over those regions, it will, it, it'll show you the structure as well as the, uh, the z-score and the log2 levels from those regions as well. Now I want to talk a little bit about these, these last two views. What you're, what you're seeing here, and we're looking at the third image right here, is a, is a coronal representation of the brain. And it's as if you were seeing the brain um, translucently. So you're looking at different structures in the brain from, from the front. So for example, I've selected on the putamen here. Right? And then you can also see that the, there's the hippocampal formation, uh, the amygdala as well, the basal and the basal ganglia. And then this final, this final image shows parts of the brain stem, the medulla, the cerebellum. And again, the colors represent the gene expression level that you are looking at uh, in, the, in the heat map. I walked through each of these, these particular aspects of the Human Brain Atlas uh, data release. So what I want to talk about now is the brain span atlas of the developing human brain. So this particular atlas was designed to characterize this, the transcriptional programs that are active in human brain development. And this particular data set has RNA-seq, exon array data, uh, microarray data, in-situ hybridization data, as well as uh, reference, reference atlases. So this, this particular project um, was a consortium. It wasn't only the Allen Institute that, that took this, put this data set together. The transcriptional profiling was, was performed at Yale and USC. Um, there was data analysis done at UCLA. Imaging, a lot of the imaging was done at, at Harvard MGH. And then, um, and then the Allen Institute did the Institute hybridization data and put all of the data, all of this data together. So in this particular data set, it's been updated to include microdissection microarray data from four complete brains and updated gene summary page to view the microarray data. We also have um, a high resolution digital anatomic reference atlas. And I'm going to walk you through this because this is also important for the adult brain, the developing brain, as well as our mouse atlases. And then with this particular data set, there is a lot of other supporting data uh, that you have access to that you can download. We also upgraded this particular data set so that it's like the human data set so that you can browse the in-situ hybridization data to the home page. And I'm going to take you into the brain span data. The interface is very similar. 
what you're looking at now is the microarray data for the developing human brain. And we have four distinct donors. The data set, again, is in a normalized gene expression. In this particular data set, I'm going to take you to the gene detail page, and it's slightly different given that the, uh, the samples were taken from prenatal brains. Again, you have gene metadata, you have information on the probe, and then what you also are seeing here is representations inside of uh, prenatal brains. So I want to walk you through this. So for this particular gene, what ARAF, or uh, sarcoma viral, it's a viral gene homologue. We have two probes. So you can look at, you can look at both, of these, both of these probes. And then we have the four donors. So we've got a 15 post-conception week, a 16 post-conception week, and two 21 post-conception week donors here. And uh, what you're seeing in this first row are seven different sections across this, uh, across this particular donor. This is the, what's, what we're looking at right now is the 15 post-conception week donor. And you are seeing colors from each of the different structures. So this microarray data, again, different samples were collected from, uh, from each structure, and the gene expression was rolled up into the structure so that you can see, so you can see the gene expression. And again, if you, if you click on a particular structure, that structure will be highlighted in each one of the sections that has that structure. So in this example, what I've highlighted is the putamen, and we're looking at the, the score, the normalized gene expression as well as the raw data for each of these regions. Now when you, when you uh, scroll down, what you'll, what you'll also see is in a particular, you'll see a particular section Right? And the section that we're looking at is, it's labeled 1352, but it's this, it's this central section here. What you're, what you're seeing here is this particular section in each one of the donors. So you can see the gene expression across donors and um, across time as well. That's one aspect you could, across development. You can change the donors from from this view, so now you're looking at all seven sections from that particular donor. And you can also change which section you're looking at. So you can look at the first section, and once you change that one, what you're looking at is the first section, first of the seven sections in all four of the donors. Again, one of, the, one of the things that you can do is once you've selected on a particular region, you can, so what I've selected right now is the subventricular zone, you can compare that zone by, by mousing over other regions, such as the subplate zone. So you can compare the gene expression in each of those different regions. Again, the in-situ hybridization data has been updated so that you can now browse through the different gene categories. And what I want to spend a little bit of time on now is our, is our interactive reference atlas interface. So first of all, for this particular data set, there's, there are several different supporting data that you're able to look at and you're also able to download. So we have um, MRI as well as uh, diffusion tensor imaging that you can download. You'll need, you'll need to have software programs that allow you to look at that particular data set, but you can also download the NISL, the uh, acetylcholinesterase uh, staining, as well as some in-situ hybridization data for each of these. And what I want to show you is our interactive reference atlas. Okay, so there's several different aspects to this. So the, you've got three different panes. You've got our, the structure ontology. In this particular pane, you can search for different regions of the brain. So if you want to find out where the colostrum is, you can, you can search for it. And what, what happens is you will be taken to, and I'm going to move these images around. So the, the, the area that you're looking for is highlighted. So you can browse through this particular 
reference data set to familiar, familiarize yourself with the structures. So we've got, I'm going to show you up in this top corner now, we have a drop-down menu that allows you to, to look through each of the different atlases as well. So we have a 15 post-conception week reference atlas. We have a 21 post-conception week reference atlas. We've got a 34-year-old human reference atlas as well. And you'll notice the thumbnail strip at the bottom allows you, allows you to move through this particular data set. And again, the claustrum is still selected here as well. So now one of the things that I want to show you that's of huge value to neuroanatomists um, is the second menu at the top that says Atlas or Nissl. So one of the things you'll notice is what you're seeing now is the annotated version, the drawn version of the Atlas. You can also in, in, include the Nissl staining that these Atlases were drawn on top of which allows you to look at the cellular architecture underneath the atlases. This little toolbar at the top allows you to take away the outlines as well as take away the colors so that you can actually look at the Nissl staining and that you can zoom in. The data is actually very high resolution. So you can look at the cellular architecture underneath this, um, underneath this particular data set. So I want to talk a little bit about the NIH blueprint non-human primate atlas. And this is actually a contract that we did with the NIH. And, and what this is, is it's a gene expression atlas for postnatal development in the rhesus macaque. And it's a contract that's funded by NIH blueprint. We're uh, currently looking at prenatal time points. There's four postnatal stages of brain development. We looked at five different structures, medial prefrontal cortex, hippocampus, amygdala, ventral striatum, primary visual cortex. We looked at about 45 key genes per structure. They're not all the same genes. Um, we also have microarray data. And, uh, and we, we looked at uh, three replicates at each of the four different time points. So, and this, this data set is uh, distinct from our, our human data sets. We don't have the reference atlases behind it. That wasn't part of the contract. So, um, you know, I've been talking about in-situ hybridization. I want to just walk through really quickly for those of you who don't know what that is. Um, it's just a way to measure gene expression. So we fix the tissue and then we label with a riboprobe. We hybridize a riboprobe that's, that's labeled. And then there's an antibody. Uh, attached to a catalyst that recognizes the probe, and then there is a couple amplification steps that result in a, pr in a purple precipitate. What we're known for at the Allen Institute is being able to do this in a high throughput manner. So, you know, we take the tissue and we run thousands of slides a week to um, allow us to look at many, many different genes, many, many different structures. Okay, and then, uh, you know, our Microscopy is high throughput, so is our, our image processing, our data storage, but it allows us to digitally put, you know, take the wet brain apart, assay it, and put it back online for you to use. So with this particular data release, we've updated the interface to allow you to see the in-situ hybrid, hybridization next to the closest NISL image. Now why this is important is because we, we don't have a uh, we don't have a reference atlas for this particular data set to allow you to see where it is in the brain. So our anatomists have gone in and, and uh, annotated our NISL atlas, so the, our, our, our NISL images, so that you can see where the gene expression is. We have uh, stage-specific reference series that I'll show you to ha how to have access to. And uh, then we have additional microarray data. We're going to go to the non-human primate data set. Okay, so the first thing I want to show you is the reference data. We, we have 
MRI data files that you can download. Um, and you need the software to be able to look at this particular data set. We also have a NISL series, and this sometimes takes a while to load. For each of the different stages, for the zero, the three month, the 12 month, and the 48 month, we have coronal NISL images, anywhere from 250 to about 280, um, that allow you to look at NISL images throughout the brain. You know, theoretically, you could reconstruct a brain from these NISL images, at, which is similar to what we did in our, uh, with the Mouse Brain Atlas. Once this, once this data set opens up, it's a contact sheet full of the 200 some odd NISL images, and it's available for you to, to uh, download. We also have other files for you to download here. Okay, I want to, uh, I'm going to first talk about the microarray data. So we've got two different, two distinct uh, data sets for the microarray data. One was microdissected, one was macrodissected. I'll show you the fundamental differences. You know, we're looking at the, the microdissection set right now. If you look through the differential search, now the, what a differential search allows you to do is it allows you to look for enhanced gene expression in a particular brain region. For the microarray data, these are all the different regions that were assayed. And in the macro dissection data, we looked at basically five structures. So there are two distinct data sets where you can look for gene expression um, in, in those regions. The last thing I want to show you with this particular data set is the in-situ hybridization data. I'm not going to demonstrate how to get through all of this all of this data, but I'll walk through it slowly so you can kind of get a sense of it. So we have a couple different ways for you to look for data. I'm going to look for data in the hippocampus because that's a pretty easy structure to see. So if you choose the hippocampus and then we're going to look for different ages, you know, you can select, you know, one or more. I'm going to select all of them. And then you also want to choose a gene. So you can choose all of the different genes, or you can just uh, look at a gene that you're interested in. I'm going to select CalB1, and then we'll search on that. And what gets returned are experiments that fulfill your search criteria. And then you can either look at the, look at the experiments individually by collect, sele selecting on these, or I'm just going to go straight to straight to, to looking at the data. So, so what you're seeing here is all of the different experiments that were done with CalB1. Now what I want to show you is it's this particular icon, big square with an arrow to, off to the side. This launches a high resolution image viewer. You'll see this icon throughout our atlases. And it means the same thing, to launch a high-resolution image viewer. And when you're in the human or the non-human data sets, what, you, what happens when you launch this particular viewer is you get two images. You get an, uh, an image of the in-situ hybridization data on your left, and you get the closest NISL image from that particular specimen right next to it. Then, and these, these two images are synced. So as you zoom in on one image, it will zoom in on the second image. You'll see that the top, there's a button in the top here that says sync. If you notice that there's, you know, that you're off a little bit, one of the things you can do is unsync them and move one of your one of your images around and then resync them. And then panning and zooming will will work. So that you can, so that you can actually look and see what see what structures you're seeing gene expression in. You'll notice that on the NISL image, there is a. You'll notice that there are little triangles that have a hot spot. And I'm going to move this a little bit so you can see because the when you highlight on a hot spot, the structure name will will show up in the top left-hand corner of the NISL image. And again, this data, 
this data is uh, very high resolution at the cellular level. The Allen Mouse Brain Connectivity Atlas is our latest project. This is a four-year project. We're um, well into it now. And what we're, what we're aiming to do with this particular data set is to do a three-dimensional map of the neural connections for the adult and possibly the developing mouse brains. Mo mostly we're doing the adult now. And um, we're using genetic approaches. So what we do in this particular data set is we have mice. We um, stereotaxically inject a virus, an AAV virus, that has the cells that are infected start to, uh, start to express a green fluorescent protein. We, um, we've done this both in wild-type mice as well as in Cree, Cree mice. And then what, what we do is we let the mice go for up to two to three weeks. And then we um, sacrifice the mice, we fix and perfuse the brains, and then we mount the brains onto a microscope, which you can see right here. We have the, the brain that's mounted in the specimen bath. Using uh, two-photon excitation, we measure the fluorescence in the block face of the brain. Now, on this particular microscope, there's a vibratome that's, that's already on the microscope. So once you've measured the fluorescence in the block face, then you section the brain. So basically what this allows you to do is it allows you to see the fluorescence in the brain prior to it being deformed by, by uh, sectioning. So basically this allows us to not have to worry about registration at all in the Z dimension. What you get from this machine is it's high resolution images, fluorescence, each machine, it's all, it's all automated. It takes about, it takes about a day to, to image an entire brain. But what you get is 140 coronal sections of the brain looking at, um, at fluorescence at one micron. So basically it's, it's, it's 100 micron resolution, fluorescence resolution. I'm going to just run this run this movie. I'm not sure if you can see this, but this allows you, this particular brain we injected in two places, green fluorescent protein in the sensory cortex and red fluorescent protein in the motor cortex. And as you move through the brain, you can see that the different projections of it. What we were able to do is we've managed to, to register all of the data so far into our three-dimensional reference space and started to do informatics on it. So there's several things that you can now do with this data set. I'm going to start here. This is our mouse connectivity data set. With this data set, what you are looking for is the injection site. You can browse by injection site using this front page, which shows, which lists all the different areas that we injected into. You can also, given that we've, we've uh, registered this into a three-dimensional space now, you can search on the injection site. So that's what we call our efferent structures. So efferent meaning from. You can look for projections from a particular region. And when you click on the text box, on the search box, our ontology will come up. And you can search on a particular, particular structure. So I'm going to just search on the prelimbic area. This data search now, as it stands, will look for any injections that were in the prelimbic area. Then you can also say, I want, I want injections that are in the prelimbic area, but also are restricted to going through a particular area. Striatum, say. And when you do this particular search, what gets returned are experiments that fit that criteria. Okay, so you can see that there are four different experiments. If you click on any one of the rows, one of the first things that you see is you get a, a three-dimensional thumbnail that you can rotate that gives you a, a preview of what the projections of what the projections look like in this particular brain. What you're seeing here is a initial reconstruction of the brain with the in the in the gray and the white. 
and then the green, the yellow and the green are the, the projection data inside the structural context. One of the things that you'll notice from these experiments is two of these experiments were done in C57 black, which is our wild type mouse, and two of these experiments were done in wild, in uh, Cree mice, in Cree lines. So when you, um, when you click on a particular Cree line, you'll also get information that allows you to go look at the, the uh, transgenic characterization of, of this particular mouse. And given that we've, we've registered this into our reference space, you can also now do a correlative search. And what that means is you can look for other experiments that show similar projection patterns to uh, the experiment that you've chosen. So I've chosen this particular experiment in this particular Cree mouse. And when I click search in, this, in, the, in the box in the right-hand side of the page, this will look for experiments that show a similar expression pattern. In the past, you've, you've had access to looking at the two-dimensional data and also looking at the two-dimensional data side by side with the reference atlas so you see what structures the fluorescent pattern, the fluorescent signal is showing up in. But now you can also look at this in three dimensions. So over the, over the thumbnail is a blue link called View in 3D. And when you click on that particular link, you're going to launch the Brain Explorer. Okay, so if you're familiar with our data set, you're going to uh, recognize the Brain Explorer um, interface. Now we've got a data set that looks completely different. I'm going to I'm going to walk you through uh, through the Brain Explorer a little bit. If you're familiar with this uh, software, just you know, bear with me for a second. So we've got your the image viewer in this main window. We've got a, a little compass in the in the top right, this this top corner that allows you to rotate the image. You have on your right hand side you have our ontology. And if you look, there's, there's three columns. There's the color column here, which is uh, basically it's just that particular structure has a, in our reference atlas, has a, has a particular color. And that's what that first, that first um, column is. We also have atlas structures, right? And you can see that none of those boxes are checked at this point. And then you also see a data column, and all of the data is, is uh, checked at this point. Okay, and then in the bottom, and the, uh, below this particular box, is our, our data list. So this shows you that we've got this particular data set so far. So what you are seeing is a uh, projection of the particular data set. So what our informatics team did is you can see this is where the, the injection site was. Um, our informatics team used a fast marching algorithm, which starts at the injection site and just and just measures the signal um, as it goes as it goes out. And one of the benefits of using this particular al algorithm is it uh, it has a vector to show you from where you came. And what what we do is we march. We march through the, the signal until we can't see the signal anymore. So one of the things you're going to notice are these little blobs at the end. If you right-click on those blobs, you'll be taken to the two-dimensional image that shows you, shows you uh, where the signal ran out. So what we're, what we're saying at this point, what you're looking at is the, is the density, the signal density, which, which basically means how many pixels of signal we're detecting uh, divided by the total number of pixels in that particular voxel. This is an example of where the signal ran out. Now, one of the benefits of this fast marching algorithm is that is that it has a directionality to it. So you can then trace a pathway from where the signal ran out back all the way back up to the injection site. So that's what you're seeing are these pathways that that follow the signal and the um, the ends of the signal where where it runs out. Now, given that this is inside of our three-dimensional space, one of the things that you can, or three-dimensional reference space, one of the things that you can do is when you click on, when you right-click on that, on that box, in the top left-hand corner, it gives you the 
structural region, the annotated structural region. In this case, it's the nucleus insertus. And you can go to our ontology, right? And if you don't know our hierarchy, go to the alphabetical version. And we're going to go look for the nucleus insertus which is right here. And if you click on that particular atlas structure, it pulls up the structure inside of this brain. Right, and so you can look at the different regions that this particular injection site goes to. So there's also the entorhinal area. the lateral part, layer 2B. So you can see this area. And with this particular injection site, so. And you can add on the different structures. So, you know, we can go look at the secondary motor area, layer 1. So you can see I, what I've done is I've added several different several different regions from our reference atlas onto this three-dimensional data, right? And just to just to give you some context as well, you can also just add on. Well, I have to go back to hierarchical. You can add on just the basic the basic regions, and this is. This is a this is a particularly useful tool because it allows you to see the brain in three dimensions and how these particular um, how the the projections move through the brain, so to speak. I'm going to go back to the web application, and you can add in other data as well. So I'm selecting on on another experiment. Going back to the brain atlas, I'm going to take off the basic cell group so you can see this. So what you're seeing now is a second injection site in the orange. And, you know, some of the regions, you know, we, this, this was a correlative search. So we're looking, for, we're looking for injection sites that showed a similar projection pattern. So you can compare the projection patterns from uh, several different injection sites. Since projections are thought to be genetically determined, one of the things that you also can do is you can look up, so if in the top right-hand corner, you'll notice that there's a search box. You can look up, uh, you know, a, a gene expression. So prox, prox1 is a gene expressed in the dentate gyrus, and I always add that one because it's a very, it's a very obvious structure. So you can download that and then go back into the detail view. And what we have now is you've got the gene expression in the blue, you've got the two different projections in the orange and the yellow, and then we've added on different structures from our reference atlas so that you can get the three-dimensional projections, gene expression, and uh, reference atlases all in the same view, allowing you to get a view of the brain that you don't often, you don't often get to see all at once. Thank you so much for being here, and I hope to see you at our next training.